about, and then making a tadpole. And here then is the picture, which you might not find as attractive as many kind of Jiminy Cricket frogs, but it's a beautiful frog to many of us because it's the first adult cloned animal. So on the top is the donor from which an intestinal cell was removed, and on the bottom is the first clone, in 1962 by John Gurdon. Now this technique then, which I'll describe in more detail later, shows that it's possible to make an, a genetic copy of an adult animal through this nuclear transfer. And here's an example where we're going to look at many copies. So on the left, you see the egg donor. So in this case, the female frog, which is, I might note, about 40% by weight ovary, an animal pretty much devoted to making eggs. Many eggs were removed from her, and then they were transplanted. That is, nuclear transfer was accomplished using a blastula from a mating of the albino frog shown in the middle. And those produced then these 30 identical, that is genetically identical, cloned adults on the right. You can think of this like sets of identical twins, but they're genetically identical. One of the points I'd like to make here is if I could draw your attention to what is here, the third row, and if you look at like the third and the fifth frog over, those frogs are smaller than the other ones. That's because they probably didn't compete as well for food or didn't do as much exercise. And this should just remind you of something I think you already know intuitively, is that your genes are not your destiny. They're important for setting limits on what can be done, but what happens in your life can make a big difference. So here we have 30 identical frogs, but they didn't all grow up to look exactly alike. And if they did things, something more interesting than they normally do, like if they could listen to music or think, we could test whether or not they actually had different abilities, but can't do that with a frog. Now, many of you will have heard, of course, since cloning is in the news so much, that cloning frogs has not really captured the public's attention. It was cloning mammals that got everyone's attention. So here is a picture of maybe one of the most famous clones, the sheep Dolly. Dolly was cloned from a mammary epithelial cell, and then the nuclear transferred embryo was put into a foster mother, shown here on the right, the black-faced ewe, and she then gave birth to this clone, the sheep Dolly on the left. Dolly grew up a year or so later, and then became a mother herself, making her little baby Bonnie. Now, there are a number of animals that have been cloned. Sheep aren't the only ones, and I thought I would show you a video of how cloning occurs. So we're now going to look at the mechanism of it. And before we start the video, I thought I would just say that one of the things that we want to attend to here is the pipettes, one on the left and one on the right. This video is prepared by my colleagues Dieter Egli and Kevin Egan. And you see here on the left is a, what's called a holding pipette, which gently sucks on the egg. The egg is surrounded by a membrane called the zona. And you'll watch this pipette on the right first drill a hole into the zona, then go in and suck the nucleus out. And then another nucleus, which has been taken from, say, a somatic cell, a cell of the body, is going to be put in. So if we could start the video, please. You'll see now that this drilling pipette is going to suck, drill a little hole into the membrane. You can maybe see a little bit of the hole right here at the next part. This pipette, you'll note, isn't really sharp like a syringe. There you can see a bit of the hole. And now the pipette's going to go in and remove the nucleus. And if you look carefully in the pipette, you'll see a line in the nucleus, which are all the chromosomes lined up. So that nucleus is going to be squirted out now because we don't need it anymore. And there we have an enucleated egg. Now the next step is to take a set of eggs like that, and I'll show you two, and then transfer into them a nucleus from another kind of cell, a fully differentiated somatic cell. So here the enucleated egg is set on the side that it's held by this holding pipette on the left. There's drilling the little hole in the membrane. Here we go in. Here comes the nucleus from the right. The pipette goes in, and these pipettes are operated with a piezoelectric device. So you can't see it here, but it's like a little jackhammer going very quickly like a Woody the Woodpecker, getting in there to then squirt the nucleus in. Here we'll see it again, a little hole in the zona is prepared, and now the nucleus is going to be squirted inside. So there's two, two examples of what's called somatic cell nuclear transfer. 
So that's a sort of long way of describing cloning, but it's technically correct because it reminds one that the somatic cells are cells of the body, the soma, and they're fully differentiated cells. And nuclear transfer is the process you just saw. Now, a large number of animals have now been cloned by using this technique. Um, I'm going to show you what is probably the most useful animal for this purpose, which is the laboratory mouse. Here we can see an example of cloning of laboratory mice where the nuclear donor is shown here on the left. And nu the, a nucleus is taken from an adult cell um, from that animal and then injected into an enucleated egg, an egg from the little mouse over far on the right. Then that recombined cell, that is with the nucleus from an, a mouse on the left and, and the egg cytoplasm from the mouse on the right, is transplanted into a foster mother here called the surrogate mother, and this is an albino mouse, giving rise to the two little baby mice there, the two clones, which should look and do look like the mouse on the left. Now this is extremely valuable to be able to make genetically identical copies in mice to study how animals develop and the role of genes in development and other physiological functions. But as I've already shown you in the first slide, this isn't the only animal that's been cloned. One can have a look here at, uh, I think that's about 10 or 11 cows that have been cloned. And you might say to yourself, well, why would you want to clone a cow? Turns out that cows that are very good at milk production are quite valuable. And to breed them takes many years of multiple generations of breeding. But here one can have a very good milk producer. Some cows produce up to 30 gallons of milk in a day. And you can then make 10 copies of that one to really improve your herd production. But cows, like horses, can also be cloned. There's a little baby horse. And this has, of course, or maybe not of course, but has at least moved into the area of pets cloning. So here we see the cloning of cats. Um, the, clone, the cat on the left was apparently a very favorite of some person who was willing to pay significant sums to create a clone. The foster mother there is shown on the right next to the little baby clone. There's a little baby kitten. And then dogs have also been cloned. Here's a, a donor on the left of an Afghan hound sitting next to her clone. And then you see in the picture on the right is the clone again, in this case next to the surrogate mother, which was a Labrador retriever. So I've often wondered if, uh, since we have dogs ourselves, whether that Labrador was a bit surprised when it gave rise to the <laughs> Afghan hound. So what animals have been cloned? Well, so far, Reported somatic cell nuclear transfer in mammals has been for sheep, dolly, as I said, cows, mice, goats, and pigs. I didn't show you cats and dogs and rabbits, horses and ferrets. Now, this isn't just a trick that biologists do for fun. As I've said, there are reasons to have done cloning. And in this case, it was initially begun by testing for the information present in fully differentiated cells. So one of the things I'd like you to remember from today is that cloning was done and the, with the point of testing for whether there are irreversible changes in the genome during development. And this conclusion, then, is one I'd like you to think a bit about. That is, from these experiments, it's been possible to conclude that the nuclei of some fully differentiated cells can be reprogrammed, the clock can be turned back, so that they can become fully potent stem cells. There are no irreversible changes in all of our genes in the genomes during development. Now, before I take questions, I want to point out one final thing, which is that cloning is a very inefficient process. The way I presented it, it makes it seem like we could go home tonight in our garage and clone your favorite pet. In fact, Something we don't well understand is that the cloning process, the reprogramming, is generally very inefficient. In the very best cases, like in hands of professionals, it can approach a 2% efficiency. And um, we don't yet understand the reasons for that, but it's not something that occurs easily or all the time. I'm going to talk shortly about how we can use cloning and combine it with stem cells to study disease. But I think now would be a good time to stop and take some questions. Yes? Um, do you purposely use different um, like types of animals? Like you had a Labrador retriever uh, with the foster mother of the other type of dog. Do you do that so you could see that the clone doesn't look like the, the surrogate mother